the dev Twitch stream. My name is Nick Taylor. I'm a lead software engineer of Forum. Forum is the software that powers dev. And I'm Christina Gorton. I'm the developer advocate at Forum. And today we have Nader with us. Nader, tell us about yourself. Hey, well, cool to be here. Yeah, my name is uh, Nader and I've been a developer Nader, advocate. Sorry. Or, or Nader, <laughs> I go by Nader or Nader. So either way, it's all good. Um, I've been a developer advocate for about four and a half years. Um, or, or maybe four years or so, but I was working at AWS before, and now I'm working in the Web3 slash blockchain slash crypto space. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm always excited to to talk about the things that I'm excited to talk about, and that's what we're doing today. So I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Cool, awesome. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Christina. Yeah, I was just going to mention, this is a subject Nick and I don't know too much about, but we want to know more about. And so we're really excited uh, to talk. And I think other people are going to be excited to learn too. And so we really want to just kind of dive in. Um, do either of you have a place you want to start, Nick? Um, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'll let Natter pick maybe, but I don't know. Like, uh, I guess first, maybe like Web3, like what what is that exactly? That's like a, a, word, a big buzzword, not buzzword necessarily, but something that people have been talking about quite a lot lately. Yeah, it's kind of like a broad term, and um, it kind of means a lot of things, I would say. And, um, you know, if you listen to kind of some of the earlier thought leaders, I guess you could call them, like Juan Benet, who is uh, one of the really leading developers slash, um, you know, leaders. And he's also someone that's created some really interesting software like IPFS and uh, Filecoin. Um, like I was watching some of his talks when I started really le looking into this stuff. And um, he's like, kind of like, I would say paved the way and then some of the ideas around what Web3 uh, means and things like that. Um, okay. And if you're interested in learning kind of more about it, definitely consider uh, Googling Juan Benet and, and watching some of his videos and stuff like that. But I mean, it's kind of like um, encompassing a few ideas around how people can collaborate and build software and also communities and and things like that in the future and okay. uh, even it's happening now but it's kind of like um really mainly focused around decentralization you know de de decentral de decentralizing companies decentralizing web infrastructure um and kind of enabling more ownership within projects and within companies and things like that and we can kind of like yeah. um talk about like you know some of those things because that's very broad and abstract like overview mm -hmm. but um you could think of it as like the decentralized <laughs> web if you really want to kind of like simplify what is web3 it's the de decentralized web and the reason okay. that they're kind of categorizing it in a different way than like what we're doing now it's because everything is different the, the ownership qualities of how you build a company are different the the tools that you use are different um the way that you think about things are just a, a lot different so it's kind of necessary i would say almost to kind of put it in a separate okay. category from what we're doing now yeah, yeah. that's something i definitely we don't have to do it right now but definitely kind of want to dive in a little bit more at some point because i did read your article uh, and i posted it for anyone in the chat uh what is web3 and kind of going through the web one web two you know when you when you wrote those things i was like oh yeah okay i know what these things are never really necessarily heard uh, those terms yeah. for them. So it was interesting to read. But one of the things that I still kind of had a hard time wrapping my head around, and because it is a different paradigm, I think, for a lot of us, is the whole uh, working together to build something, if you think of Web3. So reading through that part of like how people yeah. would come up with a app or a product and then who can work on it and all that kind of stuff was still something that was like, whoa, what's happening? And I'd love to talk about more if you know more about yeah, totally. I mean, um, there's a lot to cover, but um, I think like when you really start looking into to some of the projects and the companies that are starting to kind of really explode right now, um, it all comes down to web protocols um, when you really think about it. So like when the web first was created and, and what we've been working with for the last you know 20 or 30 or whatever years you have protocols that people use every day and that we're kind of just used to using so like http um ssh ftp you know tcp these are all things that like as a developer we just assume they're going to work and if i create a website and i deploy it then okay. i can trust that anyone in a web using a web browser can access my website via http right i don't mm -hmm. have to kind of have um any intermediary there to make it work 
I can put it on. Uh, I can put it up on the web, and anyone in the world can access it directly. There is no uh, like middle middle middleman. You could you could say right. So yeah, like we're yeah. used to these kind of like native internet protocols that enable certain things for us to do. But there are kind of like certain things that we could not do up until um, we have these blockchains that enabled uh, trustless um, ledgers where we can basically have ways to keep up with state and also payments without having a centralized authority. So really the yeah. main breakthrough really is kind of like these blockchain technologies that enable two additional things and that is native payments and native state. And in order for us to have state and payments in the past, we had to have massive multi, multi-billion dollar companies with tens mm -hmm. of thousands of people working there just to make these things happen. So Stripe, yeah. PayPal, all of these companies were there just so we could enable payments. And it's very complicated. Like if you want to kind of like dive into their code bases, imagine what it takes to enable someone in Mississippi to upload some money into their, you know, uh, into their account, send it to yeah. someone uh, across the world and have that person be able to withdraw that money and use it. Like the complexity there is like mind boggling, honestly. And it was, yeah, it, yeah, but yeah. it was necessary for, for that to happen. But now we have ways to do that, that literally take like 10 lines of code. And it's such a breakthrough that people don't really understand until they, I think, start like building themselves or maybe they start using some of these apps and then the light bulb just turns on. Yeah, and I can definitely relate to this for a couple of things. Like I remember when I worked in e-commerce, like you had to be PCI compliant and stuff. Like there's all these things you have to go through just so you can actually, you know, have a credit card system in use on your site. Uh, another thing which uh, I it, it'll probably tie into other stuff we talk about is like, there's no borders with this because like, I remember I was in India for work and like I took some extra time off because I was like, when am I ever going to go to India again, at least for the foreseeable <laughs> future. So I'm, I'm hanging out on the beach in Goa and I'm trying to take out money and I couldn't because North American cards wouldn't work in the bank machine there. So I had to, you know, I, I was able to get money out eventually, but it, I had to go through a lot of hoops to do it, you know, and like something like this, it's just like, okay, yeah, here, just let me make a transaction and, you know, here you go. So I, I can definitely see a lot of friction being removed from payments. I know, I know that's not everything. And we, we kind of, talked briefly about this before the stream because uh you know but it's worth mentioning i i think a lot of folks especially folks who are new to this space a, a lot of the association is with coins and like you know people mm -hmm. will think like bitcoin uh that's you know and the media that's a lot of what they put out there but it's so much more than that like you were alluding to at the beginning there and uh, i'm kind of excited to dive into all those other aspects of it yes we need the coin for the the payment part of things it, it just comes with it but it's it's definitely a lot more like you were saying mm -hmm. yeah i mean one of the things that was most exciting to me as a developer um coming into this space it's kind of like we're, i've been working at aws for like a little over three years and one of the things that i was really passionate about and i kind of uh, definitely am still passionate about are these uh, serverless technologies so like at aws yeah. The initial like serverless thing that was kind of a breakthrough, you can kind of bucket it as, as, as S3. So mm -hmm. with S3, you can really do a lot of like things that in the past were really complicated fairly easily. You can upload an image, okay. you can download an image, you can upload a video, anyone from the world can download it. Uh, massive bandwidth, you know, uh, massive number of items, like billions of items you can store. Um, yeah. And you don't have to understand how that infrastructure works under the hood. You just upload it and download it and it just works. Um, and since then, we've had like real breakthroughs and additional serverless services. And to this point, people are building out their entire uh, you know, companies, multi-billion dollar companies on top of serverless technologies using uh, serverless compute, serverless identity, all these other things. So to me, like that's been extremely interesting. So when I started um, diving down the rabbit hole of crypto, it was because I was a speculator buying and selling crypto since like 2000, maybe 15-ish. Um, I came across the Graph Protocol, which is actually where I ended up uh, working with now. But um, the Graph Protocol was a was a token that was uh, released, you know, and I was like going to buy some. And I started kind of investigating. I'm like, oh, this is actually 
a decentralized, like uh, it's almost like a serverless web infrastructure protocol that uses GraphQL. And I've been writing GraphQL for like, uh, you know, four years. <laughs> I wrote a book on GraphQL, like big fan of it. So that immediately yeah. just like sparked my interest. I'm like, oh, damn. So this crypto is actually like doing some shit. It's not just like, <laughs> it's not just like a get rich quick scheme or something, right? Like, because honestly, I yeah. did not look much further than that in any of these projects. And uh, like from that point until today, like it's been a night and day shift for me, like mentally. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so like the graph protocol, I started looking into it. And um, basically, it provides a serverless web infrastructure for people that want to build applications on top of blockchain data. And the way that they made it possible and the, the way they coordinated it was using tokens. And tokens kind of like play into how the web infrastructure uh, can actually incentivize developers from around the world to be involved and kind of run these web servers in a, a decentralized manner, how they can get paid, how the uh, network can participate, uh, participants can uh, participate in the network and other roles as well. And it's all enabled by these tokens. So it kind of like all fits together. Um, you know, tokens are a part of it, but they enable things like this. So for instance, like the reason why the graph exists is that um, there are, you know, now tens of thousands, I have no idea, a number of, uh, of real highly trafficked like uh, applications that are reading data from blockchains. So you have DeFi, you have NFTs, you have all these other things happening. Um, now, in the web, the traditional web world, if I wanted to build an app on top of some data, then that data is probably centralized. It's sitting in a database somewhere and I can easily create like an API endpoint on top of it. And I'm using something like MySQL or, or maybe DynamoDB. And I can read that information really easily because that infrastructure is optimized for that. But blockchains are not optimized for reading. Um, they are kind of like optimized for the use case of this decentralized le uh, ledger that mm. uh, enables like trustless, you know, um, interactions and tr trustless state and things like that. So it's not like a database that's uh, highly optimized for reading and writing. So therefore, if you do want to build out an application on top of uh, that data, you cannot do it directly by reading from the blockchain. So you can read like a single transaction and you can write a single transaction you know, fairly easily. So I can say, okay, I wanna get like the current state of the blockchain at this point in time. But okay. let's say I wanted to do something like on Twitter, I wanna get like uh, the friends, uh, like my friends, and I wanna get their tweets and I wanna see how many likes they have. Um, that data is not like there. It's basically stored in these blocks that have been written over the course of time, maybe even years. Mm -hmm. So imagine trying to kind of read that. So basically um, the graph exists because there needs to be a way for that data to be indexed and then served via an API endpoint like we would do in, in, in back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in the past, like if people wanted to build out like an optimized front end on top of this blockchain data, they would actually go to AWS or GCP or maybe even their in their in their uh, company office wherever they have their server, and they would build out this uh, indexing layer. They would, you know, um, read all this data stored in a database, build an API endpoint on top of it. But the the whole idea, um, there's a couple of reasons that, why that's bad. One of the reasons uh, why that's not very optimized is that. Um, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of time to kind of build out all of this infrastructure every time you need to build out an application. Um, you have to maintain it and, um, you know, it kind of like takes a lot of work to do. Uh, another reason that you wouldn't probably want to do this is that most of the applications that are in the Web3 blockchain space that are one of this data are doing it, uh, they, they want their applications to be decentralized. And when you yeah. store all this data on a centralized server, you're centralizing that data and you can't really trust it. Um, so how can you trust that that's the actual data that's that's stored on the blockchain if someone's actually like saved it? Like I could basically do whatever I want at that point. Um, and then on top of that, you have like a single point of failure. So um, to get around that, um, the, uh, the graph exists and uh, they created the graph to kind of like maybe solve this problem. Um, initially, it was like a prototype that was a centralized uh, version of this that was launched mm -hmm. back in 2018. And it kind of like was there to get product market fit to see if people use it. And ultimately a lot of a lot of dApps are using it. Like uh, I would say almost the majority of Ethereum apps are using it. 
Um, okay. Big DeFi apps are using NFT marketplaces like Foundation and stuff like that. Um, so what ended up happening was like after that product market fit, they continued building out the decentralized version of this and they launched it at the end of, um, really they launched it this year, but they launched the smart contracts at the end of last year. And um, yeah, and, and from there, um, it's now being used by, by a lot of applications. The official, official like uh, launch for all of the network was happening maybe about uh, sometime in July. So it's still mm -hmm. fairly, fairly new for the decentralized network. Wow. Yeah, cool. Can I ask one question real quick uh, before we go on to any other subjects? Because you said it a few times, and I want to make sure I kind of understand it in the context of Web3. Can you explain trustless a little bit? Because when I hear trustless, you know, I think of like not trusting something. Right? <laughs> so I'm just kind of wondering uh, a little bit about that. Yeah. So like right now, we have to have a trusted authority to handle certain types uh, of data. So like we okay. have to have a bank to trust that like uh, me and you are going to like transact. Um, we need like a middle intermediary that we can trust that is going to say, okay, Natter gave you, Natter gave me a thousand and now I'm going to take that thousand and give it to you. And that's like that trusted uh, intermediary. Um, whereas these decentralized le ledgers enable that to be abstracted away and automated and, and trustless. So like I can send this transaction between me and you and we don't need that that central trusted authority so therefore it's kind of like trustless i think that's kind of the way i would explain it awesome okay that makes sense to me now thank you <laughs> cool cool uh yeah before i move on because there's a lot of stuff you mentioned DeFi and nfts which we'll get to uh i just wanted to talk a bit more about the graph for a second so like from from a layman's perspective it's essentially google for blockchain apps kind of like uh, and yeah you could think of it that way okay uh i mean because like like, uh, like you with google we have all this data and like if i want to find this data how can i know that it's there google has these bots that basically scour the internet read all this information store it in a database make it accessible in an api and we're just using that api when we're uh, using the search box okay mm -hmm. and and like I've I've read a bit on it and I, I I clearly don't have as much knowledge as you or your team, but like from what I kind of that's why we have them here. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> um, so so like you you have we talked briefly about the ledger, so the blockchain, so it's contiguous blocks of transactions, and that data is kind of opaque. So like part of the what the graph does is like say if I had a video game and I'm using the graph to, I don't know, have characters in my video game or whatever, like that data initially is opaque, like whether it's like, you know, I don't not necessarily binary maybe, but it's like in some format that we need to make it in human readable form for the application to use it. So is that where the, the smart contracts come in, where you kind of have like an interface, which says like, this is the description of like this particular character. And you know, when I'm, at this point in the blockchain and like at this not address but like a certain point mm -hmm. i know that this is the alien character and then i can you know pull that out and then that gets indexed is, is that kind of what's going on or are my way off or so <laughs> it's it's interesting because it's so much different than like what i've been used to as far as how we store data um but basically you have kind of like you mentioned, like you have these blocks that are kind of written over time and, and each each time. Uh, so like, let's say, let's go step back for a moment. Let's say you want to build an application and your back end in the past would have been like a Node.js server, but in the yeah. blockchain world, it will be a smart contract. So you deploy your smart contract to the blockchain and it will be written in at a certain block number. And then from then on, you know, you're going to start having uh, transactions that happen. Every time someone writes any information to mutate the state or update the state, a new transaction yeah. will be written. And now you have like two transactions and then another person writes and now you have three transactions. Um, there are a few different things that can happen in a transaction that you can basically event source, you could say almost that data into a, a, an indexing server like the graph or maybe like you're running your own. Um, and you can retrieve that information when you're reading these transactions in a couple of different ways. So one way would be, be to read the arguments out of a function. So like I'm calling a function and I have like these three arguments. I can take those arguments 
and and basically deal with that in my um, mapping that is taking the data and storing it in the in the database, the indexing database. Um, you also have these events that you can fire uh, in a smart contract. So, like, let's say that I have um, have an NFT contract marketplace or something, and someone makes a sale, I can uh, uh, emit an event that says, okay, a new sale has happened. Um, this is the seller, this is the buyer, and this is the token ID. And then I can read that event and store that information or do something with it um, and store it in my indexing server. So you're basically going to be okay. reading this data through functions, through events, and things like that. And you're going to have to aggregate it yourself. But the, um, the API that we created kind of makes that fairly simple. Like you can basically create a um, indexing, and, and, and uh, you can index and query data in a subgraph for an NFT marketplace, for example, and maybe like 60 or 70 lines of code or something like that. Okay. And and when you, you just mentioned subgraph, subgraph is kind of like the region of the block chain or in the graph. Oh, the where subgraph is graph lives, specific. Or... Okay. Subgraph is like basically like um, you could think of it as infrastructure as code. You're kind of like telling the indexing server, uh, the indexer, what to do with okay. this uh, so with this graph that you want to build or this. Yeah. So like we call them subgraphs, but they're APIs. So like a okay, subgraph could be kind of considered an, an API. Okay. okay. So I, unless you have a question, I have, I have a question because I think we're, we're talking about a lot of. I getting deep in the weeds, but I'm happy. Yeah, to that's, that's why we're, we're talking about a lot of this stuff and I think that's great and we can keep digging in. I wonder if, and I, Nick, I know you had mentioned maybe mentioning this too, is that can we briefly talk because we have other developers obviously in the chat and stuff like that. Can we talk? Yeah. Uh, quickly, like, what is the developer stack for someone who's working with, like, Web3? I know we keep saying, well, this is a little bit different than you might think, or this might be a little... I'm wondering what is the general, like, stack, if there is a general one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. This is the first thing that I was wondering when I came into this space, too, because, like, mm -hmm. I was, like I mentioned, of course, working with AWS, but I'm also super interested in, in other serverless types of technologies. And, and typically, when I build an app, I need the same set of things uh, for the most part. I need identity, okay. I need file storage, I need data layer, you know, um, I need compute. Uh, these these are the things that you kind of like building blocks, right? So what are those mm -hmm. building blocks for um, for Web3 stuff? Yeah, so um, when I first kind of was diving into this, it was hard for me to figure that out. And um, we're, we're actually building out at Edge and Node um, a cool, like interesting web portal that's gonna kind of like go over all of the stack and kind of like dive into all the different pieces and say, okay, you want identity, these are the options. Um, but but essentially you have the front end is gonna be the exact same. Um, you have like React or Vue, of course, uh, whatever like that. So if you understand JavaScript, you know, that's gonna be the same. Um, for the database layer, that's gonna be some type of smart contract. So you can build right now smart contracts using, um, I would say like the two most popular blockchains that people are writing these types of dApps, decentralized apps or Ethereum and Solana is starting to become uh, fairly popular. So like you could okay. choose a blockchain as your, your backend essentially um, for writing you know, your transactions. Um, you need some type of file storage. So there is a very, very widely used uh, network called IPFS, it's interplanetary file system i think it stands for and you can okay. use ipfs to upload uh images and and things like that and uh and videos and stuff like that to to read those so like uh so the front end would be you know javascript layer the back end would be a smart contract on some blockchain the file storage layer would be ipfs and then the identity part to me is like really also one of the extremely interesting things about this this uh, ecosystem in this area um, believe it or not, like even at AWS, there are still discussions around have we solved identity? Because identity is extremely complex. There are a lot of ways to do it. And I think the way that we were doing things in the Web 2 world makes it even more complex because everyone's doing something different. You have username and yeah. password, you have uh, Magic Link, you have Google OAuth and Facebook OAuth. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no consistent way that people are doing OAuth, uh, authentication. On top yeah. of that, all of these different applications that are accessing this data are also 
often duplicating it on their own servers. So if you OAuth with Google, a lot of times those people are taking all of that information that you have and they're storing it on a server somewhere. And you, of course, hear about these hacks that happen like all the time where people's uh, personal information is leaked. That's just another kind of like sad thing. But but it also kind of makes it hard for uh, maybe developers to kind of like build out, you know, applications because if they've not had any experience with this form of authentication, they kind of have to learn it. And there are all yeah. types of things you have to consider. You have to think about uh, cookies and sessions and, uh, you know, you have to understand JWT. You have to understand mm -hmm. redirects and, and how all this stuff works. And it, it becomes extremely complex. So yeah. Yeah. one of the things that I like the most about uh, the Ethereum you know, ecosystem, and, and really, I don't know enough about Solana, how it works, but I'm starting to kind of get into it. But I think it's very similar. You have this idea of, of an address being your identity, a wallet address. And you have like this Ethereum wallet, or for example, that kind of allows you to not only trans transact tokens like ERC twenty tokens, which would be like cryptocurrency, but also NFTs, but also allows you to use your wallet as your identity. Um, and it the the way that a wallet works, it basically uses uh, public key encryption. So when you create a new wallet, you have um, like this seed phrase that generates. I'm trying to think if I'm if I if I'm remember this correctly because it's kind of like past it's a little bit past my scope of knowledge and i, I was like reading up on this uh, recently but i think it creates like this um this public i'm sorry this uh this seed phrase that then generates a private key um and then that private key generates your public key or something like that mm -hmm. um but using your private key to sign a transaction you can use that as the way that you can basically um, authenticate. So um, if I want to basically prove that I am a person from this address, then I can basically sign a transaction, send that information over the wire via an HTTP request on the server along with my address. And yeah. if that person can decrypt that message with my address, that's the only way that they're able to kind of like, uh, you know, decrypt that if they have my address. And if it is able to be uh, decrypted, then I've proven who I am. And it's it's all made available like with literally just like one click of a button um, mm -hmm. using, you know, your, your Ethereum wallet. So um, there's this uh, there's this idea around um, something called sign in with Ethereum that's starting to become really popular. So you can basically okay. just uh, use your wallet address to sign in. And um, the the really great part about this part is that since you're just using uh, an address that's stored on chain, then there's no reason for anyone to store any information because you're not really giving them any information to, to, to store. They can just kind of use your address and you can use that address and that, that um, authentication mechanism across like hundreds of sites and it all works pretty much the exact same. Hmm. Okay, so like your, your literal online passport kind of, you know, like, you, you don't you don't need uh. to have all these authentication <laughs> mechanisms like you're saying uh, it's literally like here's my address we're good um and it, it's this kind of brings up another thing uh i'm not sure what post you wrote it in or you might have done a short youtube video on it but i recently registered a dot eth domain name on ens domains and i was able to link it to my address uh to, to my wallet um uh, i don't know if you want to talk about that i know we're kind of going off on a few little tangents. Here, no, this is a cool yeah. area. This is just another like one of the million things going on. <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, um, like, th this is very similar to domain names. So DNS, domain name, I think it's, is that domain name service maybe? I don't know. But DNS right. is something that we've all used a million times. Like if you want to create uh, and launch a website, you don't say, hey, go to 127.3.654. You mm -hmm. tell them, hey, go to mysite.com. And the way that that's yeah, yeah. enabled is by DNS. And you go to GoDaddy and you buy a domain name for like 20 bucks and you point that domain name at your your uh, website, right? So um, that same thing is enabled now through ENS, which is Ethereum name service, I think it's called. And you can basically mm -hmm. associate a name.eth with your uh, address. And doing so, um, you can associate your, um, your wallet with, that uh, with that name and people can send you money and you can send other people money and, and stuff like that. 
Um, and it's just a really cool way to kind of like, you know, to abstract away that long Ethereum address. Because an address is typically like, you know, a bunch of characters like that no one can remember. So you end up having to copy and paste it. But it also opens up some vulnerabilities because if you type it in wrong, you you might send the money to the wrong person. So now yeah. someone can send me money to natterdabbit.eth or sha.eth is my short one that I got. And it's pretty pretty cool. It's it's like a no-brainer. Yeah. Once the... Uh... Once I saw, I, I can't remember if it was you that mentioned it first, or I think you were talking about it a couple months ago too, but you do have a YouTube uh, video. I don't know if Christina can find that, but um, yeah, I started, I got FOMO instantly. I'm like, I have to register my name before <laughs> somebody else <laughs> takes it. <laughs> so I was able to get nicktaylor.eth, but uh, I'll probably register another one. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, it kind of also adds not simplicity to it, but like you said, just rememberability to somebody's, uh, you know, wallet. So I, I think it's definitely handy. And, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not positive, but I think you said maybe in the future, you could actually use it as a domain name and your wallet or like for like, a yeah, website. I think there's already a, a way to use it as a domain name. I don't, I don't know exactly how that works, but you can basically okay. set it up to where people can visit your, your dot ETH. But I think you might have to, you might have to append it with um, something else. Okay. But, um, but like, I mean, how the, the ease of with, which transactions can happen uh like by adding that one small thing is actually like another level of like increased improved um, ux because for instance like yeah. cash app was really innovative and cool because i could just give someone my cash tag mm -hmm. and they could send me like money really easily that was kind of like to me a, a kind of a breakthrough moment in in um in fintech um yeah. like i'm doing some like collaborations over over the years right with people all over the world and just to send money from one country to another, like, um, like I've, I've, I always give them my Ethereum address and they never use it. Instead, they're like, oh, give me your bank account, your routing number and your, um, your Swift code. Yeah. And, oh, and, oh, we tried to send it, but like, this is wrong. And, we, and we'll go back and forth for like a week and they'll send yeah, me like yeah. 500 bucks. <laughs> and like, they literally could have just like typed in SHA.eth and like sent yeah. me crypto and it could have been there in like literally like, you know, a couple of minutes. Um, yeah. It's just like, you know, that huge of an improvement in, 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 I guess, user experience. <laughs> yeah. But having yeah. that, that short name is just, uh, to me, like pretty huge. Yeah. And, and you touched on this before with the trustless, you know, because it's trustless, you don't have that third party. And the third party adds lag to these transactions, too. Like there is a cost to it, too. But like. Yeah. Like for example, for example, because I'm in Canada at Forum, I, I can't be an employee because they're they're a US based company at the moment, at least only. So I got set up as a contractor and, you know, I had to send my bank account, the Swift code, all that stuff. Like you said, it took like a week or two to get it sorted out properly because on the U S side there, the accountants were like, uh, we can't find your bank. And it's like literally the main <laughs> bank in Canada. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I just kept sending them the finally got sorted out. But like the other thing too, is like you're charged, like, ridiculous fees just for transferring the money to i know there is transfer fees within in the in the eth too but uh it's just you know and there's a huge delay in terms of when the money gets transferred to like if i send out like an invoice like i had an invoice sent out today i'll probably get paid in seven or eight business days it depends because there's there's just lag so it's like the mm -hmm. whole thing seems kind of broken to me i mean it's uh so yeah, I mean, I and, and what's even more compelling is like when you start thinking about all of the complexity that has been built into the financial system just to make it to where it is today. And it's not it's still not even close to being good. But yeah, yeah. even with all of the work that they have, it's still where it is today. And you have like layers and layers of complexity, and abstraction and bu bureaucracy and waste. Yeah. Um, and all of that is there. It's kind of like mm, essentially made unnecessary at this point. And I think like yeah. you're starting to see people realize that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. And I guess it's a good time to kind of start talking about a lot of the bigger things. You, uh, I'm not sure if Christina dropped that web, uh, that blog post from me yet about uh, the creator economy, but we've mm -hmm. talked briefly about you mentioned DeFi and NFTs, which we can dig into more, but these are, these are from what I read in either your article or one of the articles within your article, 
it's saying like nfts and DeFi stuff that's kind of like the what and then the why in the is kind of like the DAOs, these decentralized autonomous organizations so that's what it's right for, right yeah so yeah so I, I wonder if you could touch on DAOs first and then maybe we can dive into the maybe a, a few other things like nfts and DeFi a little more after yeah i mean it's wild how a lot of these things kind of over, uh, overlap into each other you know because like again we talked about tokens and crypto and then we're talking about nfts DeFi, DAOs. um when i when i yeah. first heard about nfts actually i was really right really thinking it was such a dumb idea and i was like why would anyone like do this <laughs> and like the more and, and that was initially like how i felt like hardcore um yeah, yeah. but like my, my ideas have evolved over time after being exposed to kind of what's actually you know happening um and i think that there is a fair amount of overlap again between a lot of the stuff but um taking a step back i mean a dao is basically a new way of people running businesses and running companies and running organizations and stuff and it's essentially enabled by tokens the tokenization uh of of companies um yeah there's a really interesting book called The Token Economy. If you want to get your mind extremely blown, uh, go buy that book. <laughs> this person has literally like done the most research I've ever seen of, of anything and okay. broken down every single part of like why crypto is actually like starting to kind of like change the way people are doing stuff in different ways. But like but yeah, there's a huge part of part of it about DAOs in that book that was really, really great. But um okay. I think the the most simple way to think about it is in the past if you wanted to create a company what the 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 roadmap that most people took was one of two ways they would bootstrap it or they would get venture capital um yeah. both of those ways um essentially like take a lot of time and um you know capital to kind of get going and and it, let's let's talk about maybe the VC route because that's kind of what you typically see for these unicorn types of startups. You have an idea, you want to get this idea built. You you might create like a prototype or something like that. You might get a founder and you're you're hacking away for six months to a year. Um, you start getting product market fit. You you take a first round of VC. You know, two, three, five years later, you kind of get more and more money. At some point, you've gotten like I don't know, a hundred million dollars. And you've been building yeah. for like five or six years and you're still not profitable and then you take on like even more money and you might go public and then like one day like 10 years from now you're like gonna start paying the investors back and and all of that um and the people that that got equity were typically like the first 10 100 people or something like that when i say equity yeah. i'm talking about like meaningful equity um and then maybe some of the people that come in after that get like you know shares in the company and stuff like that and the people that actually, uh, you know, get all these these stocks and stuff, um, they pr they probably can't really cash them out for a couple of years. And um, if the company like flops or something like that, then no one gets anything, I guess. So that's kind of like what we're used to, and it works. And it's worked well in certain situations. It hasn't worked well in other situations. Um, I think the idea that that DAOs bring to the table are kind of like reversing that order um okay. let's say instead i have a track record and i've built like some really awesome applications at, at netflix and facebook or maybe even open source stuff and like people know that i, I know what i'm talking about i have this really yeah. interesting idea and um i have another engineer like on board with me and we wanted to build out this company and i basically write like a white paper and i build out like a prototype and i kind of show it to the world um what if we didn't have to wait five or ten years to start you know, um, getting ownership and equity and, and, and things like that. What if instead we could launch yeah. a token and we could say, hey, we're going to basically um, have a governance system that allows people that own the tokens to help uh, make decisions in the company. We're going to issue tokens to the world. And if anyone thinks this is a good idea, they can buy into the company and they can do that right now. You don't have to be like a privileged, like, you know, multi-millionaire that has some insider trading to get in on this ICO uh, or what, the IPO that happens like five years from now. But instead, anybody can 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 join in. And okay. not only that, if you're a developer, or if you're if you're a marketer or something, and you jump in our Discord and you like help some people out, I'll, I'll even give you some equity as well. And all these people are starting to gain equity um, early early on. 
and yeah. the tokens have a way to be liquidated or bought and sold because there are now these decentralized exchanges like Uniswap where I can basically create a token, put it on Uniswap. Anyone can go in there and now buy that token um, if they think the project is cool and the and the price starts going up and down, whatever, just based on the free market. But um, early on, you have people that are now like participating and they're, you know, they're helping out and they're building and they're part of the early team and they're getting tokens and they're becoming invested and the growth happens a lot more like i would say organically because you have people that are extremely extremely invested now early on they feel like they're founders uh the people that have started the company early on also can become wealthy you know early and and early developers can can gain equity and things like that. So that's kind of like yeah. one way that you would look at it, uh, how a DAO could work, um, okay. where you're basically tokenizing a company, and um, the decisions are made based on token holders. So instead of like me saying, "Oh, we're gonna um, decide to stop serving Asia because of like some regulation that happened," instead we're gonna put that to a vote, and um, yeah. anyone that has tokens can help make this this big decision in the company. And uh, that's how like a decision might be made. Um, okay, cool, cool. There's also like social clubs, which are kind of interesting to me, where basically I can say, okay, um, I'm part of this DAO called Friends with Benefits. And okay. to, to be a member of Friends with Benefits, you have to buy some tokens. And mm -hmm. once you've bought these tokens and you're part of this, uh, this community, you have this Discord server and everyone is together working uh, together on that Discord server. Uh, doing cool stuff we're collaborating we're sharing ideas we're doing parties we're doing get togethers and stuff and people start wanting to be in on that and you can actually invest in that so like a a16z just uh i think uh bought some tokens um okay. because they think friends with benefits is like a good investment because they see that some of the more innovative people are in here doing stuff and we're going to start spinning out other other projects out of that and as those projects become successful, then the value of those initial tokens also become successful. And then I'm, I have one more last one, and we can move on. Yeah, yeah, no, go <laughs> the, ahead. No, the, it's definitely I want to talk about how NFTs like actually get into this as well. So yeah. okay. there is this uh, early project, or oh, when I say early, it's it's only been a few months, but NFT space is moving <laughs> so fast. Called uh, the Board Ape Yacht Club, and it was kind of like just a really inexpensive NFT project. You could have bought in for a few hundred dollars. Um, and now I think the cheapest one to buy is something like a hundred thousand dollars or something something wild like that. But um, this development team created like this NFT project, and anyone that bought into it now feels like they're like part of this community, right? So like um, that's how a lot of these NFT projects work. And you started seeing like really famous people uh, start buying these NFTs. So Jay Z bought like a CryptoPunk and. Um, okay. you saw, I think Des Bryant, and then there's like this really famous, uh, Warriors player. Uh, of course his name is like escaping right now by the board ape yacht club. And yeah. everyone like started wanting to be in on this. So what they did was, um, they decided to launch another, uh, project, uh, a few months later and they raised $90 million in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes by okay. selling, uh, 10,000 more items. And they have basically raised over a hundred million dollars at this point. Any transaction that happens after that, they get a percentage. But what they but it's not just okay. about the money. Like you now have a community of like twenty five thousand people that are really invested in this. The developers have a hundred million dollars that they're going to now use to build out some really interesting stuff like uh, merchandising uh, collaborations. Um, they're going to do like TV shows, like that type of stuff. So you now have a brand that's been created. Everyone that bought into the project has equity in it. And there's really no telling what they're going to do at this point. But like the momentum is there. And, and the, uh, the, the, I would say the synergy between like the creators that are like, you know, being part of that project, the people that bought into it. Um, and, and all that, like the equity just sticks around, I guess you could say, like, it's not like, um, where I'm buying into like, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an angel and I give 5,000 bucks and I don't see anything for like 10 years here. Yeah. You, you're an angel and you buy something for 10,000, you could sell it tomorrow for 15,000. Like the, yeah. the equity yeah. sticks around, like it, it's, uh, there's more ownership, you know? Mm-hmm. No, it's, you know, it's very cool. Uh, 
I did have a question about NFTs because this is this is I'm I'm basing this on this headline skimming I've seen, so I haven't dug too deep <laughs> in it. But uh, I, I get the idea that you're you're selling NFT. It could be any kind of media. Like a, a lot of it's been, I think, avatars lately. Like I've seen, I think you had one which was a, a monkey at some point, and you've switched yours a few times. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of like, I I think maybe it's just me, but like. Okay, you have like say your your avatar is on your Twitter, for example. I'm like I'm just gonna right click download image. Uh, I have the avatar now. That's I have a copy of it, but it, it's it's kind of like in the art world where like if somebody created a replica of the Mona Lisa or something, right? It's like yes, visually I have your avatar now, but there's no authenticity to it. Is that kind of the just yeah, there's so much to talk about in this in this whole area. <laughs> like um, the the to answer that question though, I think like the more people that copy the Mona Lisa, the more expensive it get, it becomes. So like mm -hmm. if, okay. if 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 I'm watching a, a movie and like someone talks about the Mona Lisa, and then I and then I like leave and I um, get in my car and I like turn on the t the I turn on the radio and someone's rapping about the Mona Lisa, and then I go home and I'm watching the news and they're talking about like Paris okay. and they mention them. Like the more people that mention your thing, the more popular yeah. it becomes, the more valuable it becomes. So I think it's actually like that's something point. that's encouraged by people that own NFTs, like copy it, make t-shirts out of it, steal it, do whatever you want with it. The more people that yeah. see it, the more people that use it, the more valuable it becomes, just like a, a typical piece of art. But I also recognize that there is a huge amount of hype right now. And a lot of it yeah. is probably, uh, for sh a lot of it is surely a, a bubble. So like, mm -hmm. You know, when you see these things like rocks or whatever selling for like a million bucks, like God yeah, knows yeah. what's going to happen with those. But like yeah. my assumption is that like that market will like see like a correction at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So um, but so like there's good things and and there there's you know relatively like bad things that that are happening all at the same time. But I think what yeah. you're seeing though is like a fundamental understanding now that people can um buy into and become parts of these communities. And these communities are building brands and those brands are now continuing to build out new things that are benefiting their community. And you have that synergy. So the money is going into these teams. The teams are producing value for the, uh, you know, you could call them almost investors, but they're really like people yeah. that bought into the community. So there are really some dumb NFT projects, but there are some interesting projects that are building out what I think are going to be like the future, like brands, things that you mm -hmm. could think of as like Adidas or Nike. Like these are going to mm -hmm. be... Yeah the types of nft projects and you're now starting to see that the, those types of brands are trying to get into it but it typically is going to work the other way around in my opinion it's going to be yeah, hard for yeah. nike to kind of like i mean they could do something right they have all this money and stuff they can, they can probably come up with something interesting but i think what yeah. you're going to see is like the actual growth is going to come organically from creators and artists that have these cool ideas that can now actually generate uh, money and build build communities and, I, and i'm really interested in seeing this applied to tech so like let's yeah. say i want to build the next Vercel or the next netlify what mm -hmm. if i hire like two or, or i get two of like the most well-known engineers like in, in in the entire whatever space and we partner with like one of the most well-known artists in the in the world and we generate an nft collection to bootstrap our uh our our application that we're gonna create and make open make open to the world. Now every okay. developer that buys into it is now invested, and they have uh, some NFT or something to go to show for it, and they're gonna promote it. And now you have ownership, like you have actual mm -hmm. ownership. You don't have a VC that you have to fucking yeah. like kiss their ass. Like it's yeah. to me that like that discussion that we just had like in the last thirty seconds like is the most exciting thing for me when it comes to like NFTs. Yeah, it's, it's it's something I hadn't considered, like a merchandising and an entire brand, just because from what I've seen, like, because I haven't seen too too much of it aside from just these avatars. But it makes complete sense, and and also, you know, like literally anybody can make anything now as long as people say, hey, that's a good idea, and then they buy into it. Whereas, like, I don't know, like if you go the old school route, you know, like you're trying to convince Nike to make your sneaker because, like you know, the design or whatever. And like, they're going to be like, no way for whatever reason. And here you're just in your, in your own 
brand now that you've you've created with the community and you can just like hey yeah we're gonna make sneakers with i don't know like boomerangs on the back and somebody's like that's dope <laughs> let's do it you know and it just happens you know like i that that kind of blows my mind a bit it's like there's no i mean people have always been creative but it, it's like the barrier to actually execute is kind of evaporating with something like this it seems like so yeah to to summarize this for myself, would this be sort of like a trustless Kickstarter type thing? Like you don't have to wait for like the money. Like you tend to have to do with Kickstarter. Like you have to wait, you have to wait, you have to wait. If yeah. you get enough, then that thing gets to go off. Whereas this is like, no, we're investing in this now and let's do something about it. If they want to use the NFTs in that sense of like this brand and creating stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a completely new thing. Like, I don't think anyone has a good way to explain it, even myself. Mm -hmm. I think you have to kind of like watch it and experience it to, to see it and, and see it happening. Like, join one of these discords mm -hmm. and see the discussions that are actually like happening and and some of the events and things that are planned out. Um, and I don't know if like even from a securities perspective, any of these teams would even call it fundraising. Um, okay. You know, because like you're, you, because then you're kind of like, oh, you're now like crossing that line of, and that's the thing. Like a lot when you when you're dealing with uh, digital tokens and tokenization, the the lines start to really blur around, you know, a lot of the the laws and stuff that you see that we have in place in the United yeah. States. Um, yeah. So it's gonna for the United States to continue to be a leader in this space, regulations and stuff um, need to be there needs to be more clarity around like what is and what isn't a security and things like that. Right. Because like how easy yeah. is it for someone just to open up shop in a country where it's completely, they know for sure they're not going to have any issues and they go there and they create their company. And now all of that, uh, all of that, that revenue that's generated goes, uh, leaves the United States or, or whatever. Um, yeah. But yeah, the lines are being blurred. Like, and I think that, um, that if you look at what board, Ape Yacht Club did with over, like, you know, I mentioned over $100 million and every transaction again gives them like another percentage of the sale. Um, that model to me is probably the most interesting thing that I've, I've ever seen as far as like fundraising is concerned. And I do think that you are seeing other, other people take, take notice and you're going to see a lot mm -hmm. of that type of stuff happening. And again, like just to be completely clear, there are huge, huge shifts and um corrections that are probably going to be made i wouldn't ever tell yeah. someone to go buy an nft as an investment uh, mm -hmm. i would say yeah, if, yeah. You, if you do want to get involved in these communities like just assume that whatever you buy is going to go to zero just go in with that mm -hmm. assumption <laughs> yeah, yeah. because like god knows what's going to happen right like yeah. don't ever go in this like with an investment in mind but do go into it recognizing the community aspect and expect to make friends and have a good time and, and that's kind of that's what it's all about to me yeah that's yeah. a good point I like how you summarize that because, like, I mean, what we do is we're all about community. Like, that's that's literally the soft, kind of software <laughs> we built. So, and it's it it's really become like an integral part of any you know whether it's tech or whatever. Like, community is what drives adoption. It brings people together. I don't want to sound cheesy and stuff, but it really is. Like, and I, I've noticed. Uh, in the tech space, a lot of people are like, I know you, you've worked in DevRel, uh, you know, Christina's our DevRel, uh, like there's this big drive to, you know, get communities around, you know, products and tech or, or technologies in general. So it's kind of interesting that it's happening over there too. I, I yeah, it is. And I think it's going to be hard for the traditional tech companies to, to compete with these types of uh, organizational structures within the next year or two. Why? Because why would someone like time, like time and attention is the ultimate thing that people, that companies are trying to get these days, right? Like yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. the attention is like the, the digital currency, right? So I think we've gotten the, past the point where people are willing to give their attention away for free. And to now with tokenization and with these sorts of things where people are actually getting paid to use these platforms. So for instance, mm -hmm. one of the most interesting things that to me that happened in this sense is there's this uh, NFT platform called Super Rare. And okay. since you are signing in with your wallet and your wallet address is now made public uh, to that, that application when you use it, any person that uses the app is now written to the ledger. So what they basically okay. did is they decided to send money or they, they decided to create a digital token, put it on the market. Everyone 
it became really popular because everyone like wanted to to buy into it, like VCs and all these other investors and stuff. But the okay. the smart thing that they did, they decided to send tokens to every single person that had ever used their platform ever in the past, up to oh, awesome. like five thousand to a hundred thousand dollars worth. So like mm -hmm. when you start seeing those sorts of models, and people are going to get paid to be part of these communities, um, because of the the way that tokenization can kind of like enable these types of business models, why would yeah. someone go and try to participate in the community of uh, of like this, you know, behemoth company that has like a billion uh, dollars in revenue, like a, a week or whatever, um, that's been around for 300 years, that nothing, that all of the benefit of their time and attention is going to like the CEO. Why mm -hmm. would they spend their money and their time and effort there when they could go to a local community that they can actually benefit from? And I think you're going to see that be a massive shift. No, for sure. And there, there's other interesting things too, like the, uh, I know we have this on dev, Hashnode has it too. And there's like this notion of payment pointer. So like if you write content, uh, I don't know if I imagine it, as long as it's a web page, you can basically have a web uh, payment pointer on it. And I just think it's neat that folks who have any kind of uh, token can can say, hey, I like that article. I'm gonna give a bit of, you know, bit of bit of money there and stuff. And and I've, I mean, I haven't got a ton of money from it, but like I I bought my ETH uh, domain name from just getting uh, the from the payment pointer, which was kind of cool, nice. I found, you know. So it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah. People you know, recognize that even in the Web two space, you can make it happen. You know, just um, but attention is yeah. becoming like so scarce. Like you know, there are people who are innovating ways to get attention. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. Cool, cool. So we've we've, we've kind of talked about DAOs and and NFTs now. Um, I don't know if you want to maybe dive into DeFi a bit. I, I I've worked in fintech briefly, uh, so DeFi is decentralized fintech, and yeah, again, I guess this it's obviously based on the technologies that we've been talking about. You you get this decentralized tech out of the box and it's just being applied to fintech i imagine that's that's the deal yeah i mean before we kind of like dive into that we uh since we're kind of like finishing the discussion on nfts there is a subject yeah, yeah. i kind of wanted to bring up and i think we had talked about this before is the environmentally uh unfriendly nature uh, oh, yeah, of yeah, yeah. blockchains um so yeah, yeah. yeah like a lot of the discussions you see happening on twitter or at least you used to see with someone would be like you know um I saw a thread where someone was like going on a rant about artists, you know, making money on uh, the internet because uh, using NFTs because they're uh, destroying uh, destroying the world, and and they were basically saying that mm -hmm. artists should feel like really shitty for doing that. Um, and you know, I kind of like thought it would be a good thing to address because like it is it is yeah, yeah. a problem. Yeah. Um, there, so like the whole idea around the environmentally friendly or unfriendly nature of blockchains is around their consensus mechanism. So how do you actually draw consensus around um, if a transaction is actually valid or invalid? And the way that basically this has been incentivized in the past was through something, and this is only in the past through certain blockchains, like um, how yeah. Ethereum is today and how uh, Bitcoin is and will be. It's called uh, proof of work. And to validate a transaction, you basically have to run this algorithm over and over and over until you kind of get to the um, the number that basically matches the part of decrypting, I think, the transaction, something in the transaction or something like that. Basically, you have to do a, a, a bunch of computation to get there. And it's basically you're basically wasting energy. So yeah. um, Ethereum currently does use proof of work, but they've actually already deployed something called proof of stake. And it's been used for maybe uh, a year or so now that actually is going to be um, an, an environmentally friendly consensus mechanism, so much so that it will be magnet, orders of magnitude uh, more environmentally friendly to transact NFTs than physical art. And this is going to be merged maybe in like okay. six months or five months or something like that. Like it's already running on a, um, a test network and there's yeah. already um, billions of dollars of, of staked uh, Ethereum. And that and that's kind of like how proof of stake work. You basically stake some money there. And if, if you approve yeah. a transaction, then you're basically saying, okay, like I'm putting this money up and, and I'm saying that this transaction is valid. And if it's not, you can take this money and like I lose it. So like it's a, the financial incentive. 
But basically, like mm -hmm. once proof of a uh, stake is finally mer merged into the main chain in a few months, it's actually going to be more environmentally friendly to do NFT transactions, which is really exciting yeah. to me. Yes, I hate that NFTs are currently using proof of work. It actually sucks really bad. But I think to mm -hmm. kind of get to better parts of the world, sometimes you have to kind of like, you know, um, you know, start somewhere, right? You can't like probably yeah. start in the best place. You start somewhere and you get there. But I think the important part is like we're finally getting there. Um, Bitcoin, on the other hand, still uses proof of work. And I actually don't, I sold all of my Bitcoin and I don't really like, like to be part of any of those um, uh, cryptocurrencies that, that still use proof of work because I do think that they're environmentally wasteful and I don't really, you know, yeah. have any, I don't really want to be part of that. So, <laughs> but I thought it was like yeah. something that I would want to, um, you know, address. Yeah, and a yeah, lot yeah. of, a lot of cryptocurrencies use proof of stake or they use environmentally friendly consensus mechanisms. The most popular ones for smart contract development all are environmentally friendly. Uh, at least yeah. Ethereum, once Ethereum is, it will be. And then the other ones already are. So, yeah. yeah. No, no. Thanks for mentioning that again. Cause yeah, I remember we we're like, yeah, let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. yeah. It's a valid, it's a valid, uh, point. And, um, uh, but I think, I don't think it's yeah. so binary, like, oh, it's all like all blockchains are this, right? It's actually more of like a nuanced discussion. There are good things and there are yeah. bad things happening. And I ultimately think that we will all move to the environmentally friendly chains because yeah. most people actually do care about that stuff. Yeah. No, yeah, for sure. Um, Cool. So yeah, we, we I feel DeFi. like there's still so much to talk about. Yeah, let's talk about DeFi now. Um, what's what's DeFi to you? We'll have to have you on a different there. time to talk about everything. <laughs> I mean, when you think about software and you think about uh, technology, whenever someone creates an app, um, if you kind of really boil it down to to something, it's essentially we're abstracting away something, right? Like. When you create yeah. like a to-do app, you're abstracting away the process of like, you know, writing that down yourself or maybe opening up Word and trying to keep up with that yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So like when you think about all the software that's been written, there's essentially for the most part, right, like some thing that we're doing that's automating or making some other thing that we used to do easier in, in the past. So DeFi yeah. is essentially that same principle applied to all of the things that we used to do in the finance world. So okay. one great example of that is there is a, an exchange called uh, Uniswap that allows you to try to, to change um, money or cryptocurrency from one cryptocurrency to the other. And it's done uh, using smart contracts. And it's done, it's, it does like billions of dollars in transactions. And it does so with like a really small team of maybe like a few dozen people or, or less. I forgot the number of people. It, when I heard the number, it was like, unbelievably small so um that's like one you know form of DeFi where you're basically doing some type of transactions between uh, different currencies but uh like okay. i think the DeFi that most people think about is like the financial transactions that we used to do in, in the old world applied now yeah. via blockchain technologies uh most for most part like ethereum is where most of that that stuff is happening so lending borrowing um you know um I would say things like liquidity and uh, whatever you might have done in the past via um, like going to your bank and like doing all that is now being programmatically done in smart contracts. So Ave is a is an interesting uh, project. Um, let me go to their website so I can kind of like quote exactly what they do because I don't want to like miss. Oh yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, so. On their website, it says Aave is an open source and non-custodial liquidity protocol for earning interest on deposits and borrowing assets. So it's a borrowing and lending platform. And lo it looks okay. like right now they have $24 billion, $604 million um, of liquidity right now. So if, um, if I wanted to basically take my Ethereum and make some interest on it, I'm not going to use it for a year. I could drop it here and I would earn like, you know, a certain amount of interest. Um, okay. So... There's all types of different DeFi applications, but essentially what they're doing is abstracting away like what you would typically do in the financial world, but you can just do that programmatically with uh, within a smart contract using using your wallet. And I think the most interesting thing about this is that some of these um, protocols are being run by teams of like a few dozen that are taking this doing the same amount of volume that a bank 
um, a traditional bank would need tens of thousands or uh, thousands of people to do. So I think that's okay. the most interesting thing. Like these things mm -hmm. are actually happening because all this stuff is being automated. You don't have to have um, 10 floors of a building in New York City and pay the payroll and pay the insurance <laughs> and pay all of that crap and like have 100 employees that are like, you know, doing this work that might not, not be necessary. Instead, you have a smart contract and it's automating all of that away. And I think like inevitably like tech just kind of does that like you know if something can be automated it will be automated i think smart contracts just kind of like bring to the table new ways of, of automation um for good or for worse you know like you might argue that this is bad yeah. because you're taking jobs away but uh yeah. you might argue that this is good because you're freeing up you know capital and resources that were being wasted uh for things like you know that were maybe unnecessary and uh, to get a, a certain job done yeah and I'm probably saying the obvious here because we've we've kind of talked about it with the ledger and stuff, but you have guarantees that you know these 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 money transactions because like the transactions can be anything I guess in the blockchain, but like when we're dealing with money, like there's no tampering. You know, like if you screwed up something in a transfer, you have to make another transaction to correct and stuff. You can't just go back and like you know erase what's in the ledger because uh, uh, you know. So there's I think that puts a lot of confidence in people too potentially um yeah there's definitely finality and that's good and bad because if you do something wrong you're you're yeah. you're out right you did you're you're done you've lost it it's gone um if you lose access to your wallet for for whatever reason you also lose those funds so if you if you lose your private yeah. key or if you lose your um your seed phrase you might be locked out of of, of all of your money um there's also smart contract vulnerabilities so like okay. there has um there these are especially common in contracts that are kind of like um the more complex contracts often that are built on other people's contracts. So like when you start okay. chaining together these contracts that are all, you know, they're all open source and they're all just on the blockchain. So um for instance, um Uniswap has an exchange, but their exchange is just a user interface built on top of a smart contract. So I could go and build out my own exchange on top of their contracts, my own front end. Mm -hmm. Um but anyway, yeah, so like there are vulnerabilities sometimes. So if I pro if I program something wrong in my smart contract and I put it on the internet and I ask people to use it and if someone, you know, puts in a million bucks or something and I, and I miss something and, and they could lose that. Like, you know, so that's something you have to keep in, in mind and keep into consideration. And um, it's one of those things that it's still so early, like it doesn't happen that often, but it, it has happened. And um, yeah, I don't really know um, any advice other than I would say, use the, the protocols that are tried and tested and that are trusted that people have like okay. used for a long time. And if someone comes out with like a new, um, DeFi protocol that promises like some really high return on investment. Just be very careful and be, be wary, very wary of, of, of new things in the DeFi world because you want to be um, extremely careful and safe. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, you mentioned about like losing your, your wallet or like there's, I know there's physical keys too, like hardware keys and stuff. Like, like I think that stresses me out to some degree. I mean, I think if you're diligent about it, you know, it's probably okay, but it's still like. Yeah, like I said, my like father-in-law lost his twice now. Yeah. He's done this oh, where wow. it would have been like a lot of money. He, he doesn't, he didn't, <laughs> so. the way you said it, he didn't sound too stressed out. Like, yeah, you know, whatever. No, uh, but, it was because he was yeah. really into it, but his wife was not. My mother-in-law was like, stop, okay. you're always on the, yeah. you know, watching stuff with bitcoin get off go away <laughs> yeah but, you lost but yeah I, yeah i guess i mean it's maybe out of the scope what we're talking about but i i think there, there's obviously some uh best practices for maintaining your wallet i imagine like that folks can read up on but like i know because i have some old co-workers that were big into crypto so they all had hardware keys like years ago and stuff and you know maybe it's super paranoid maybe it's not i don't know but uh it's like, I'm thinking even like my one password right now, I have, I printed out the backup codes and like the master key and all that. And I have it on a piece of paper tucked away, but you know, it, I, I can definitely see it being more traumatizing if you had a million dollars in your account and you, you lost access to your wallet. So, and, uh, I, I could definitely, somebody mentioned in the chat, uh, Anthony, uh, he was saying 
for you know for somebody who's non-technical i could see that as being like a, a barrier to entrance into this potentially you know like oh, yeah. there's no way i would like nothing against my mom but there's no way i would let her have like uh, a, a, a wallet uh, on the blockchain i have to reset her password every now and then on, on her yeah on her yeah this is a good that's a good talking that's a good point for us to kind of like you know discuss because it's true i think that when you start looking at the data the interesting thing to me was like the the percentage of the generation what is what is the youngest generation generation z or something like that is that gener- yeah i think yeah. so i yeah i feel and old i don't know Gen z? Like let's go with that the demographic is or 25 <laughs> like the percentage of people that hold a large majority of their net worth in crypto in that age yeah. group was like 50 percent or something wow. wild like that um so when you start seeing that adoption early in that high like rate it's going to continue yeah. to grow amongst those people so you might not see your grandparents or even your parents um adopting it yeah so i don't think it's gonna like be a zero-sum game i think certain people are still going to do the traditional things certain people are going to get yeah. into this it just opens mm-hmm. a new a new way of doing things a new way of building companies a new way of investing um but I also do think that there can be a lot of improvements on the user experience part. So like, what if you didn't have to keep up with that stuff? What if there was a way that you could kind of like make this a little bit better? And there are people also working on that. So I think the combination of the growing adoption between of of the younger crowd, along with the improved user experience, along with just the momentum that you're seeing, will kind of continue that 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 driving the momentum. For sure, and I, I I can relate to this completely. I, I used to work at McAfee. I used to work on a password browser extension, and like the hard nut to crack with all these things was like you know passwordless kind of stuff. You know, like that's why we have Face ID, Touch ID, all these biometrics because like you know you have one password to remember for all these passwords, but even that can be tough for people and stuff. And again, it ties into the UX, the adopt you know adoption of these things like there's people that don't use password managers because they still don't want to you know remember that long complicated password for all their passwords they'll still go my dad has post-its on his like laptop still <laughs> like uh, which i try to get him to stop doing but it's i can see it being like the same kind of way you know it's like just improving these things uh to make them be adopted more so and it's you know it's not it's not a easy nut to crack because it's always a balance between providing enough security and and usability and that's you know they're kind of counter into they're they kind of go against each other those two things so i think that's why it's a, a tough nut to crack uh, yeah yeah uh, totally yeah but I, I do think one improvement around authentication and and, and things like that are that ethereum uh types of wallets do bring to the table is that once you have your wallet, you never have to actually create a new password ever again for any website. You can sign in with Ethereum across all of these websites. So you have one thing to keep up with. And um, it's an important thing, but if you can keep up with that one thing, (laughs) then you never have to think about it again across all these other websites. And then another area that we haven't touched on and we kind of started getting into a little bit is around um, self-sovereign identity. Um, We talked about identity and how like um, other websites that you use like you know have different ways of ident- identifying you but um there is a growing you know movement but also a growing number of options to implement something that is kind of like categorized as self-sovereign identity where you as a yeah. user can def- uh, control your identity using your ethereum wallet address and you can create okay. and update your profile in a central place or when, when i say central like a single place on the blockchain or on some decentralized uh, network yeah. where you can go in and you can go ahead and say okay my username uh is is like this you know based on my my address um this is my yeah. profile picture and you update it in that one place and when you authenticate with your wallet then that application can then talk to that other place where you have your identity stored and then every application that you use can just access that information. And then whenever you want to change something, you just change it in that one place and it propagates to a hundred or a thousand websites, whatever you've already interacted with. And you have full control yeah. of your identity mm-hmm. and you only give them the information you want and they can't really, if they decide to track you and, and all this other crap, they can't really do anything with that information. Yeah, no, it's a good point. It kind of makes me think of some other stuff that's been out there for a few years. Not, not the same thing in terms of, 
security or anything like that but like gravatar did this with emails you know so you could mm -hmm. propagate it i mean to to some degree That's exactly you know, people good, good. Yeah. that are like i mean Technology. uh you know using google like it's kind of, i've kind of used google as my kind of main internet passport to some degree uh but but the grab the gravatar one's the <laughs> one that really sticks with me to what you were talking about uh yeah, I mean, the UX of like using something like Google OAuth is so nice compared to username and password, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think like this would be yeah. taking it just like a step further to where that they would never actually have that information about you that, that you don't want them having. Like, you're not going to have to give them your email and your phone number if you don't want to. You can only give them whatever information that you decide to give them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, not, I'm not sure if you mentioned this before, but in terms of authentication, are there are there projects in place now to do uh you know like single sign on with ETH? It, it exists already yep. yeah okay. yeah it exists already i did a video on it um okay. using something called idx which is the identity protocol something um and it uses a ceramic network which is a decentralized storage network kind of like a decentralized database um there's okay. also an rfp out by the ethereum foundation and a grant that they're giving out to a team to decide on a spec for sign in with Ethereum. So okay. I'm in actually a working group, and we're uh, I'm I'm part of, I'm, I'm I'm not really participating in the discussion because the, the the people there are a little more technical <laughs> than me. But it's been interesting to kind of like watch the discussions because they are forming that. So like how GraphQL has a spec and like all these other different things have mm -hmm. a spec. This be like a spec, and then it can be implemented by protocols that want to do it. Okay. But it'll be more of like a, a more consistent thing that everyone uses. Okay, hmm. gotcha. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really interesting. I definitely I could see I could see companies that already do like authentication. I won't name any names because, but but you know, in a good way. But like they could add this as another option, like going forward. You know, like hey, I I already use this and it allows me to sign in with GitHub, Twitter, whatever. Oh, you know, I just enable the flag and I add my keys for that, and now I can authenticate with ETH and you know you haven't essentially you haven't changed anything in your app it's really just authenticating and authorizing you so I I don't know it's it seems really interesting and I, I definitely like the idea like because we were talking about you have it was kind of funny the way you said it but like centralized information in a decentralized uh you know structure but but yeah, like saying like on, you know, on this site, you know, like uh, I want them to see my first name, last name and birthday because they need it. But every other site, they all they need to know is my first name or something or uh, it's a government thing. I need to send my address. And you, so I think that's that's still pretty interesting. And, and, and you also see this idea of anonymous and pseudonymous, pseudonymous identities uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. like you might have one wallet with your public information that you you, you all you might have to give someone your email address for some reason. So you might use your public identity for that. And then you might have a pseudonymous identity for applications okay. that you don't want them to have any of your information. So um, you might you just be authenticating just to use a service or something like that. And all you want them to have is like your address and that's it. And yeah. then uh, you can choose to like if, to use that. So like there's a couple of ways that you could approach it, but um, but like, Either, but when you're using OAuth, you often have to pass over your email address. In fact, I don't think yeah. there is an OAuth method that doesn't allow you to not do that. Yeah, I think only because I've been in the kind of in the weeds of this recently. But like, uh, I think Apple Sign On, it, like if you if you want to enable social logins on like iOS, uh, the iOS landscape, you have the option to not provide your email with Apple Sign In. I think. Oh, but nice. Aside from that, Apple seems to be that, doing better on a lot of like the security stuff. I think the most most uh, companies. Yeah, but I think like you said, everywhere else, it's like you need the email. It's part of of when you sign in. So, uh, cool, cool. All right, uh, I'm just doing a time check here because I want to be mindful of your time, uh, Nader. Uh, we're at like 120. We've got we're booked for another 10 minutes. Uh, I was wondering if there's anything else you want to talk about or uh maybe we could, I, there's still like so much stuff to talk about honestly like we could probably have you on for another 10 streams i think but um yeah i guess uh well one thing you did mention uh actually this is to give a shout out to you but you 
Uh, Christina dropped it before, but your full stack Ethereum course there, I believe you mentioned that's going to be part of the official documentation in the Ethereum docs. Is that right? Yeah. So when I first started uh, getting into all this stuff, I wrote up all of my thoughts into an end to end guide that I published on Dev.2 actually, and it did extremely well. Um, also got published to a few other places like Free Code Camp, and then I did a video on it. It's yeah. called The Complete Guide to Full Stack Ethereum Development. And uh, to me, it was kind of like the guide that I wish I would have had when I first started getting into all this that yeah. defined yeah. like the basic stack of the front end, the Ethereum development environment, um, and you know the client library to interact with the, the Ethereum node, all that stuff like end to end, how it all works together. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I've like done in the last couple of months is that I've been talking to the Ethereum Foundation about building out like a very, very high quality polished version of that to kind of accompany yeah. their documentation. Because if it was, if that was already there when I was like getting started, it would have been like pretty nice. So we, I was like, you know, yeah. why don't we, we do this? So yeah, I'm actually working with them through a, a grant that is going to be building out, I think it's going to be something called like how to Ethereum dev or something like that. But it's going to be okay. kind of like a concise um, one stop shop for developers looking to get started building out dApps. And we're going to start yeah. with like just an end to end guide for building out Hello World and then an NFT marketplace. And then we're going to add sections for like layer twos, which are basically okay. more, more high throughput, higher performance versions of Ethereum. And then we're going to have a sign in with Ethereum. But it's just going to be like maybe four or five tutorials, all really high polished, like high quality and, and up to date. And that'll probably be. The first version of that might be shipped in about two to three months. So, um, okay. yeah. Yeah. No, and for those who haven't uh, gone through that uh, blog post, it's very thorough. I'm about two thirds of the way through it, but like I'm literally following the instructions and it's bang on. You know, sometimes, uh, well, it's still fairly new. So maybe over time you might have to update some things, but I, it, it's like compared to a lot of other tutorials I've done, they, it, it, you know, people make assumptions that they know what people are doing at some point, you know, and this is like, really like, no, do this change to this. And so I, I find that very helpful, regardless of where you are in your like, you know, developer journey, whether you're, you know, starting off or senior, it was, it was super helpful and clear. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, I was going to yeah. ask you, uh, what what is your because uh, we were talking about NFTs before, kind of maybe to do a fun wrap up. Like, what what are some of the more interesting NFT stuff you're enjoying right now? Uh, yeah, I mean the the idea of like that board ape yacht club is pretty fascinating to me. The way they've built like this globally like recognized brand through, with celebrities and stuff being involved with just a couple of months. I'm keeping an eye on that. That seems pretty interesting to me, though. Maybe the more the more actually interesting ones like you know for me personally that are not really like having anything to do with um you know the business model type of stuff um are kind of like the yeah. smaller um artists that have been doing this stuff like early on that um okay. started maybe 2017 2018 you know before this became popular like yeah. i can't afford any of it but like looking at it it's pretty <laughs> interesting so um yeah. there's like these this cat this uh, collection called fidenzas it was like the first um dynamically um gen or, or yeah dynamically generated art based on code um those okay. things are extremely expensive but th th that's an interesting project there's this really interesting project called the currency and um it's let me see who who created this it's it's a really interesting project because it mixes a bunch of things So the currency was created by, let me see here, Damien Hurst. Okay. And it's kind of like not only an NFT, but it's kind of like a, a work of art, like societal art and, and culture and like all these things mixed together. Um, okay. And basically he created like these NFTs and he put them for sale and you can buy one of them. and to to match every single nft that he put up for sale he actually created uh an exact copy of a painting and he locked them in this vault somewhere in europe somewhere or something like that and if you buy one of these nfts you have the option to either um 
redeem it for an actual piece of art. And if you do that, you have to burn the NFT, meaning you have to like uh, destroy it. Okay. And if you don't redeem the piece of art by a certain date, then the actual physical copy gets destroyed. So oh, no it's kind of an experiment to see like who decides to burn the NFT to get the physical art and who doesn't and like which one ends up becoming more valuable. But he also called it the yeah. currency because he views NFTs as an actual currency. And he okay. thought mm -hmm. that like by doing this, he could uh, pump the, maybe not pump the value, but he thinks like the value of this will become like an actual currency. And that actually happened now. I think the cheapest okay, one of these yeah. that you can buy is like $50,000 or something like that. Um, nice. But it's kind of like a really cool social experiment that's like playing out like right now. And you can watch people like uh, doing, doing it. Like I think Drake, like, you know, the hip hop artist Drake basically um, used um, one of these paintings and, uh, and, and some album art that he's doing. He just put it on his Instagram a couple of days ago. So you're starting okay. to see like culture like uh, hip hop culture and different parts of the r like real world starting to get in on this NFT stuff. And when you see projects like that, that's kind of interesting to me how they're mixing up all these different things. Yeah. 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 No, that's really cool. Awesome. Um, do you have any other questions, uh, Christina? Or No, I think you did a great job just explaining a lot of like the higher level yeah. stuff of just, I think a lot of people have questions about and confusion about or um you know maybe misconceptions about it. so i think we've covered a lot of those things and i think um it's been really interesting i've dropped a ton of links for anyone who's in the chat i'll also put them in uh, our youtube description when we put it on youtube for people who want to explore this more and understand more um and we just thank you again for chatting with us like this is this is really cool yeah, it was yeah, yeah, my no. pleasure to be here. Um, I think like if anyone wants to get started, like being involved in this space, the coolest and easiest way is to, to maybe participate in the DAO or, or in the grants program, meaning that you can okay. get paid to, to participate. So um, I did a thread. You can just uh, search on Twitter for Dabit3, probably uh, grants DAO or something like that. And I, this tweet will probably come okay. up. I listed out like over 30 different grants programs. Like we have a grants program at the at the graph where we give out anywhere between three to five million dollars per round. And that gets okay. split up into different projects. So like let's say you have a good idea for like a GraphQL tool or or maybe you have a good idea for a blog post or some some whatever content even, you can get paid for that. Um, and you can get paid either in tokens or in, in cash. And there are all these different programs from all these different other um, projects as well. So look at all those projects. If you want to get involved, that might be a good place to start. You start learning about um, the different projects. You start meeting people in the community. You get paid for it. It's, 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 it's a lot of fun. So that's where I would get awesome. started if you're listening and you're interested. So. Cool, cool. Awesome. Well, I just wanted to say thanks as well, Nader. I mean, uh, you're like one of the awesome folks in the dev community and all this information has been so helpful. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be rabbit holing for probably the rest of the year now. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this was really, really great talk. And yeah, who knows? Hopefully we could have you on again at some point and we can talk a little more about maybe some other aspects of uh, Web3. That's awesome. Yeah, I really enjoyed being here again. Thanks for the invite. and. Um... I also really enjoy, you know, following you on 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 Twitter, and I always look forward to seeing what you have to say. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, thanks again, man, and take care, everybody. Uh, just a reminder: next week, uh, Chris Coyer from uh, CodePan and CSS Tricks will be joining us, so that should be a fun one. So bring <laughs> your uh, CSS chops with you, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.